Aloha. Welcome to the Condo Insider Show, the show all about association living. My name is Cheryl Franklin, and I'm your host today. And today we're going to be talking about the subject of, of fiduciary duty and why it matters. And we have an expert with us today. We have attorney Jane Sugimura. Welcome, Jane. Thank you for having me. Cheryl. Yeah, it's our, it's our pleasure. I think Jane is, uh, is one of the few experts out there on this topic. So let's dive right in. First, share with us, uh, with the audience, something about yourself. Well, I'm an attorney and I practice at the firm called Clay Chapman, Iwamura, uh, Police, uh, and Avrel. And, and we do practically everything except criminal and family law. So we, you know, and, uh, and one of the issues is condominium law. Yeah. Well, let's dive right in. Uh, why don't we kind of talk about what is fiduciary duty? What does that mean? Okay, fiduciary duty is a legal, uh, it's a legal term and it implies a legal duty. It, and it, what it describes is a relationship between uh, basically two people. And uh, uh, an example, a good way to uh, describe it, to give an example, is a trustee and beneficiaries, okay? And a trustee usually has some assets that they're taking care of, a bank account, maybe some real property with uh, investment income. And the duty of the trustee is to take care of those assets and report to the beneficiaries uh, about the status of the, the, the assets and to, to maintain those assets so that they, uh, they, they grow. Mm -hmm. right. to, you know, in other words, grow and improve to the benefit of the beneficiary so that when it comes time, to give it to the beneficiaries, you know, everything is, uh, um, you know, uh, increased and, mm -hmm. and, and um, in value. And, and that's uh, a duty that is uh, required of condominium board members. It's in the statute. And there's a, a, a statute. The condominium statute is five, chapter 514B. And the specific reference is 514B uh, 106 lowercase b. And that basically provides that board members shall have uh, all the association, which is all of the unit owners in an association, a fiduciary duty and exercise a degree of care and loyalty uh, required of an officer or a director of a corporation. Wow. And, you know, so, so this means a big that, deal. that they have a legal duty. They have a legal duty. That means if they don't comply with this legal duty, mm -hmm. they can get sued mm -hmm. and they can be personally liable. Yeah. That's, you know, th that, and so that's what they have to, you know, that's what makes it very important that they understand what fiduciary duty is all about because they have it. Yeah. Yeah. Once well, you get elected to the board, you've got it. Yeah. Excellent explanation because I think we toss around that term quite a bit and laymen, before they get on the board, they don't really know what it means. So I think that's, you know, very good information um, for board members to know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like you're saying that it means that they, at the end of the day, act in the best interest of all, of all the members of the association. Right. Because sometimes um, homeowners, they get on the board for various reasons, not realizing their level of responsibility. Right, when, they, when, when, a, when, a, when a person, you know, joins a board, They've got to take off their personal hat. Mm -hmm. And let's say, you know, you got on the board because, you know, your big gripe is you didn't like what the resident manager was doing with landscape. Okay? And so you decide, okay, you get the votes and you get yourself on the board. And you find out that it's not so much the resident manager. It's because there's not enough help. Yeah. And, and that means hiring people, spending more money, and maybe raising the maintenance fees and getting the owners upset. Yeah. Because the owners always get upset. And the maintenance fees go up. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know why that is, but uh, you know, and and so so boards are always reluctant, you know, to do that. And and what I think, you know, what what boards need to know is that raising, the, you know, going out and spending money sometimes is a good thing. Not a, so much a good thing is you have to do it. Yeah. And in other words, if the building, if the building is deteriorating, you need to pay money to maintain it. To reduce the cost of the major repairs, if you don't do anything at all, right? And 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 for and for a board member, to know or, or don't take the steps to find out what's what what needs to be done, and actually take steps to do it, 
yeah. you know, means that in, in the future, you might have to pay a lot of money. And I guess one, 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 one example is pipes. Now, oh, yeah. so now oh, yeah. everybody is having problems with their pipes. And the problem is, is that when, you know, years ago, maybe, maybe five, 10 years ago, when we were all doing our reserve studies, people said clay pipes would, would last, last forever. For, forever, right? Yeah. And we're finding out that they nope. don't last 40 years. They're failing. They're yeah. failing. Yeah. And, and there's no money in the reserves. And what happens when you've got no, not enough money? Everybody starts pointing fingers at right. each other. Say, ah, right. oh, you should have known better. You should have done something. And, and because, you know, in order to fix the problem, you need to go out and, and, and borrow millions of dollars. Right. And, right. And, and, and the owners will say, well, geez, how come you guys on the board didn't do something? And how come you're coming to me now to special assess me for this problem that you guys didn't knew take, about? You knew or about. And the didn't problem take is, action on in the yeah, past. The problem yeah. is that they didn't know about it, and, but now they know, and, and now they're taking action. And, and it, is, it, it is a very hard time for both yeah. boards and unit owners. Uh, and, you know, rather than pointing fingers at each other, they should be trying to sit down and figure out a way to resolve this to get the problem fixed because they ha it has to get fixed. Yeah. And it, ha it has to get fixed and it's going to cost money. And so rather than trying to blame somebody, you know, I think the, the more positive thing is to say, okay, fine. Uh, now we know that it's got to be fixed. And so now we have a a, a number, and the issue is how do we get the funds for that number, right. to pay for right. that number to get the repairs done. Right, and that's when your fiduciary uh, duty comes to the forefront, right. because you can't be driven by, like you said, maintenance fees, I want to keep the maintenance fees low or not raise the maintenance fees. You, as a board member, have a responsibility to, to ensure that that association is fiscally sound. And the same thing is coming to the forefront now, with what are aging buildings, and some of those buildings don't have what fire or fire systems, sprinkler systems, right. and so now they're having to um, invite in experts to kind of look at that and evaluate the cost of that, and right. that's a whole another legal issue at this right. point. And you probably know all the right. intricacies of that, even with you know, the state and what they're requiring and the statutes are going to require right. going forward. That's and, a mess. That's a really big one because and, and you can it, save, you save difficult. lives with that. Yeah. And it's very difficult, you know, for the, uh, for the average person who sits on the board because mm -hmm. most people are laymen. Mm -hmm. Okay. In other words, you don't have a particular expertise in construction right. or accounting or legal matters or, or, or whatnot. You know, so most people are lay people. Mm -hmm. And what the statute basically says is that, you know, if you, you know, if you don't know, you must ask. It's called the business judgment rule. And the business judgment rule basically says that if you're not an expert in the plumbing issue, then you have to go out and hire an engineer. And the first thing I know with a lot of boys, ah, that costs money. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, but, you know, unfortunately, you have to pay for this opinion because you have lay people on the board who don't have the expertise to make a decision for a twenty million dollar repair, right? And if you're fixed, you're you're staring at a replacing all of your pipes. You're talking about multi million dollars in repairs, yeah. And you want to be able to talk to an expert to tell you. And you know the business judgment rule basically says that you know if you go out and you hire an expert, one who's qualified, you pay for their opinion, and you make a decision based on that opinion. Uh, you've done your good faith due diligence. And if it's wrong, you can't be sued right? because you followed the rules. You did what was requested of you, and you're, that's all the law says, is you've got to do the best you can with the information you get. And, and if you're the board member and you don't know, you, and, if, and if your board isn't going out for an extra opinion, you should demand it. Mm -hmm. You should demand mm -hmm. it, saying, you know, all of us, we're all on the hook on this, you know, so we need to have somebody guide us. Right. Because we're not experts. Right. And I don't care if the board president, you know, has a, an Uncle Joe who's got an engineering degree who says, oh, no, or a plumber, plumbing company, and he, the, that Uncle Joe says, oh, no, this is how you do it. That's not an expert opinion that the board can rely on. Yeah, yeah, and that lends itself to conflict of interest as right. well, right? right? Right. And a conflict of interest, and the statute also uh, talks about that. That's part of fiduciary duty. 
That means that, you know, if you have a pecuniary interest in a decision, pecuniary means money, which means that if there's a decision before the board that could benefit you personally, in other words, you, you, you would benefit personally where the other board members will not. And a good example is if your husband has a plumbing company and submits a bid to replace all the pipes, and he's got a different name from you, and they don't know, you know, yeah. that he's your husband. You need to raise your hand and say, uh, "That's my husband, so I can't vote on the contract." Because you would benefit right. if he got the job, right? right? So that's what, what a conflict of interest is. And so, you know, being transparent. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, what you you would need to do is to uh, declare your conflict, it's and it's got to appear in the minute. And, it's, and the, the secretary will note that your conflict is, and that's why you didn't vote on it. Mm -hmm. Because with all board minutes, the statute says that all the I's and the nays have to be re reported. In other words, you can't say, the minutes can't reflect four nays and three. It has to say, board member Jones, uh, Sugimura, uh, uh, Gillardy, uh, you know, Chang voted nay. And board members Smith and Jones and Harris voted aye. Mm -hmm. It has mm -hmm. to be in the board minutes like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that people later on, if they want to know who voted the A, I, or an A, know who did it. And it's this, fully disclosed it's in full, the minutes. Fully disclosed in the minutes. Yeah, yeah. All a part of doing that um, due diligence, if you will. Right. Yeah. And I also find when you, when you speak with experts, um, and then you take that advice and you go out to bid. It's always a, a best practice to get multiple bids. Yes. And, and analyze them apples to apples. Right. Um, and then have experts look at that even. Right. Uh, to make sure, because like you said, most board members are laymen. So they're, they're not the experts. And their property manager is just going to advise them. They're not the experts either in right. all these different uh, industries right. that the association is responsible for. Right. And, yeah. you know, and, 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 and a lot of board members, you know, but what I've seen is they like to punt and say, oh, well, my, I, I rely on my, my property manager for that. Mm. But what, what they don't understand is that the statute and the declarations say that the board shall be responsible for the management of the building. That means that when they hire a managing agent like Hawaiiana or Associa or Touchstone, those people are um, uh, vendors, you know, who are hired by the board to assist them. They're not the decision makers. The decision makers are the people who sit on the board. And, and you know, and they need to be able to acknowledge that and to accept their responsibility that the property managers are there to assist them not to make their decisions for them. The ultimate responsibility is theirs. Right. Yeah, it's the board. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Well, I don't have to agree. That's the law. That's the law. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of the law, um, many board members, that, that there's a lot in the law that they need to know. And so I think it's an important that maybe we speak a little bit about how our boards or how they should be educated because there's a lot to learn mm -hmm. um, because you, you have preconceived notions before you're on the board uh, and then you get on the board and, and you really get into the minutia of how boards are run right. and there's a lot to learn. And you know I know that a lot of property managers, I don't know if this is done uh, universally but generally I understand with property managers when you get on the board they hand you a packet, you know a binder or a packet and in the packet are the declaration and the bylaws and the house rules for that particular condominium. Okay. And some people even, some property managers even throw in a copy of 514A or B, whatever yeah. is applicable at that time. Although 514B, which is now the only statute that applies to condominiums, it's on the website. So anybody who, with a, you know, who wants to look at it can go to the, uh, uh, the DCCA, State of Hawaii, Real Estate Commission. I think if you put in Hawaii Real Estate Commission, that will take you. A whole plethora. Yeah. Right. Of resources for right it. And, yeah. and and all this stuff is on on the internet and yeah. so it's not like you have to go out and buy yeah. a, a, a statute book like you, the old days right you, <laughs> you just you know go on the 
the, the internet and yeah. you can pull up 514B in, in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah. So this is a real good spot to take a break. Um, let's take a break and we will be right back. Thank you for joining us with Jane. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off, and so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Hey, aloha everyone, and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us and uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Welcome back to Condo Insider. And today I'm chatting with Jane Sugimura about fiduciary duty and why it matters. And before the break, we were just speaking about uh, boards becoming educated in the statutes and their responsibility and, and um, what that entails. Um, why don't we talk about why it's important to comply with those statutes? Okay, the reason why board members need to know about fiduciary duty and how to comply with it is because they're going to get sued. And, and, and maybe they haven't been sued yet, but you know, according to Sue Savio, who represents a whole lot of uh, you know, condominium associations, I mean, Hawaii, for some reason, has got the largest number yeah. of DNO claims in the country. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that happened, but it, it, it happens. And so that means that you know, uh, the board can get sued. And, you know, you, and to give you an example, there was a, a suit in Maui last year. And it dealt with a disability of a, of a unit owner. And the board decided that he wasn't really disabled. And they... they, they How do they decide that? They, 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 because you have a bully for a president oh, and I... eight sheep who let him get away with mm. anything he wants. Mm. And not a good mix. No, not a good mix. And so they made it, you know, they, they, they started finding them for putting in a wood floor without so-called asking for permission, except two of the board members had wood floors. And, you know, and this is a blind person. I mean, he wasn't uh, totally blind, but he was blind in one eye. He had a condition which made his eyes deteriorate. So he could see pretty good in the daytime, but at night in darkness, and he, had, uh, he couldn't see peripherally, mm. you know. So, mm -hmm. so he had to have hard force. He couldn't have carpet because you would he would trip over it oh yeah right yeah so and then so and then he had a cane and so i mean so the tap 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 i guess interfered and what started it was a person underneath complained about the noise from the wood floor so they started suing i mean they they started fining these people mm -hmm. and it went on for over i mean and they fined them something like 65 dollars a day and it went on for over 200 days Wow. So they find them because A, they didn't believe he was handicapped, and B, because of the noise, when there's an easy remedy for right. that. And, and right. They did, you know, to and they didn't, you know, because he didn't submit. To, to, yeah, to give him a reasonable accommodation. And they asked for a reasonable accommodation, which was denied because they didn't believe he was blind, because they saw him walking his dog in the daytime. And he could see in the daytime. You know, he could see in daylight, but he, he had a condition which made his eye, eyesight deteriorate. He couldn't drive at night. And, and so, but, you know, so he had a medical condition that was, uh, that was documented. How and does anyone not know that's a slippery slope? You don't want to... Because, well, for one thing, we found out in retrospect in talking to the lawyer, the property management company, mm -hmm. um, uh, this was like their first project. So they had no experience. Oh. They didn't know about fair housing. Mm. And the attorney who was representing the association didn't have a clue about fair housing and that it applied to condominiums. 
Wait, what? The perfect storm of like In ignorance. Ignorance. Yeah. And you had a bully and for the nine, president and eight sheep. Oh wow. And and so finally, I mean, this went to court, and and it went on for about a year. It ended up with a, a, a jury verdict, a jury verdict, and then to me that's scary, but a jury verdict of $1.9 million against the association. So for, they just started there with the jury. They didn't, no mediation or no, no, no mediation, no nothing. That. But what happened, see what happened is because of the fines, they started to foreclose on the unit. Oh, okay. okay 200, do, 200 days times 65. Is a substantial amount of, and this is during the priority of payments period. So naturally, uh, they were paying their maintenance fees, but everything was being applied to the penalties, to the, and you couldn't keep, you know, you couldn't pay enough maintenance fees to pay off the sixty-five, the daily, you know, sixty-five dollar daily penalty. And so it was on the day that they were going to foreclose, they were doing the foreclosure auction that the the white, the the names I can't remember the uh, the last name was White. The White's attorney filed a lawsuit on the day that the foreclosure auction was happening to stop the sale. That's how it got, that's how this lawsuit started. And, and it ended, and even the judge tried to mediate it, but it ended in a $1.9 million uh, verdict against the association. And in that case, the board members were individually uh, named. Oh, that's where I was going. Like, what happens thereafter in terms of that $1.9 million? Okay, $1.9 million. The, the verdict, the, when the verdict, when, when the attorney moved for a verdict, uh, uh, the judge would not allow it to uh, pertain to the individual board members. Even though when they were deposed, they all said, all the eight sheep, Said, oh, well, yeah, the board president said we should do this, so we all did it. We all so agreed with him. The and, 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 and this was unusual. This was unusual because there are other circuit court cases where condominium board members have been sued, and the courts have, have held that they're absolutely liable. Maybe personally. Personally. And not, and, and not um, all of them. Because remember we were talking about the board minutes? And how the I's and the A's have to be noted. When when a per, when a board member gets when a board gets sued, you get a letter from the insurance company saying, "Thank you for the tender. We are accepting your tender under a reservation of rights." And what that what that means is, yeah, we got we, there's an insurance contract, and you got sued, so we got to defend you. But we don't have to defend you to the end if we find out that you guys you know, reached a fiduciary duty. If we find out, and how do they find out? During the Discovery. course of, yeah, during the course of <laughs> yeah. the litigation, you ask for documents, you do depositions, and the insurance company attorney looks at this, and after a while he says, my God, these people breached their fiduciary duty. They didn't, you know, act independently. They're eight sheep. They did whatever the board president told them to do, and nobody, you know, they didn't go out and find out about disability and fair housing and, 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 you know, the reasonable accommodation was made in writing and they just, you know, ignored it. And, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't ask the right questions. And that's, that's something that they shouldn't have done. Right. And, 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 um, and so uh, in, in a case like that, and it has happened, and it happened at the Marco Polo many, many, many years ago where the insurance company decided to walk away and, and, and told the, and, and, and it, only single out two of the board members, the president and the vice president. They excused everybody else. But the court in that case held the president and the vice president personally liable for breach of fiduciary duty and fined them. I think the president got fined seventy five thousand and the wow and the, the vice president got fined sixty five thousand. And this is twenty five, thirty years ago. You know, when it, the, that was big money. And, Absolutely. And, and, and what we heard is that the vice president sold his unit, paid his judgment, and left the state. Never to be heard from again. Again, yeah. But, you know, what so, an experience, so, yeah. You know, so so it, it, is, it, it does happen. And so, you know, if you're a board member and you don't comply with your fiduciary duty and you get sued, 
I mean, you might, you know, you better make sure that your homeowners has got an umbrella policy yeah. that's going to cover this claim. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, if you d didn't act appropriately, you know, by the time you get sued, it's too late. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, the, the, your actions are already recorded in the board minutes. And, um, and you know, so you could be exposed uh, to these claims. Yeah. And so, to me, it's, it's, it's really easy to be a board member and comply with your fiduciary duty. That means that, you know, you need to, you know, look at the issue that's being voted on. And a lot of times there is no issue. You know, there's, there's a, a landscaping contract. There's three contracts. And maybe, yep. you know, they're, they, you Get know. Re check references. Check you references. Evaluate the pricing. Right. Yeah. And everybody agrees. And that's fine. But, you know, if there's a. In a perfect world. Uh, you know, if there's a controversy and there, you know, and you haven't, and it, and it shows, and it shows later. And nobody did their due diligence. Nobody asked for an expert opinion. Like when they got the request for reasonable accommodation, who did they send it to? Did they send it to a lawyer who knew anything about reasonable right. Or, right. Or, the, or, or, or fair housing? That's where you start. Yeah, and then so if they didn't get you know the, the, the right legal advice, and you know why did they ignore that? I mean, they could have gone on the internet and probably typed in you know reasonable accommodation, and they these would have days, all, yeah, yeah, you, you can... would have popped up and and. And told them, oh no, you, you got to be careful because you know this is this is a uh, this is discrimination, right? Yeah. You know? so, yeah. so so you know so they 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 need to board members need to know that you know they have to ask questions and they have to act independently and you can't just vote you know for the president, vote, right. yeah, because you, you know you think that he knows everything because right. you you do that at you get your yourself peril. into trouble. You really right. do. You need to be independent. You know, because somewhere down the line, you know, you may be singled out. They say, ah, okay, he voted nay, that's fine. He may be the only one. And, and so, yeah, we're going we're gonna to protect him under the DNO. Yeah. Because if you, like I said, under the business judgment rule, if you follow, if you, if you go out and you get the opinion and you follow, even if the decision is wrong, you're, you're protected. protected. You're and protected. that means under DNO, your carrier will protect you. Yep. Due right? diligence. Due, yeah, due yeah. diligence. Doing the right thing, right. best practice. I mean, you could go on and on. But I think, you know, this show is very beneficial in educating boards. And you're also a member of the HCCA, right? right. And it's important for board members, I believe, to take advantage of educational go, classes and seminars. Right. And CAI they're out some. there. Yeah. yeah. We're, they're to, out there. To educate, to educate, to keep you out of trouble. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think um, you've been, there's so much information, and um, even in terms of complying, you know, just at the end of the day, if you just, um, like you said, act collectively as a board, do not be a yes person, um, utilize your attorney, and at the end of the day, just ask. If you're not sure, and bring in the experts. Right. You know, and at the end of the day, that, that lends itself to safe business practices as right. a board. As right. a board. So um, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for all that information. It's a lot to take in, um, but um, it's, it's very necessary that boards learn these things so that maybe one day we won't have the largest number of DNO claims, claims in, in, the, the in the country. country right. In the country. That's kind of a big deal. So right. um, thank you again. For joining us and thank you again Jane and um, please join us again um, thank you very much Carol Franklin Aloha <laughs>